psalm this morning is taken from Psalm 51, it's on page 239. <clears throat> We're going to do the verses 11 through 15. Starting with verse 11. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. I shall keep your ways to the wicked, and sinners shall return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, and my tongue shall sing of your righteousness, O God of my salvation. Thank you that you have gathered us together this day. 
may in the name of your great and awesome Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He lives, and because he lives, so do we. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, now we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would make us alive to your word today, that you would be our teacher, that whatever is of sin or temptation or the flesh would fall to the ground and die and be of no effect so that we're completely available to all you have for us now. Holy Spirit, be our teacher, and let the word of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts, be truly acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Over these last couple of Sundays, we have been talking about the reality of spiritual warfare. And that you and I, because we belong to the kingdom of God, are at war with the kingdom of Satan. And therefore, we need to be prepared to meet the enemy and overcome him. Today, and really over the next few Sundays, I want us to consider the armor of God that we find in Ephesians chapter 6. What it is and how to put it on so that we can meet the enemy, stand firm against his attacks, and have victory. But there's one thing that I want you to see here very clearly before we, we move forward into the pieces of armor. What we find in Ephesians 6 by the Holy Spirit is very important for us to hear. And it's this. The Holy Spirit says, put on the whole armor of God. Now, this is Scott there. Let me ask you a question. Whose armor is it? Is it yours or God's? It's God's. See, that's very important for us to see. Because God knows that in ourselves and in our own strength, we cannot overcome the enemy. He knows that. So he is not asking us to make war on the devil in our own strength. Instead, he has been so gracious as to give us not the armor of one of his angels, not the armor of one of the other heavenly beings, but his own armor. Understand what that means. If God gives us his own armor, let me ask you another question. Can the devil overcome it? No. Because it's God's. So if we will put on the armor of God, we will overcome the enemy. Not because of our strength, but because of his strength on us. Without God's strength and armor, we cannot have victory. But with his armor, we cannot fail to beat the enemy. Amen. Let's remember that. So with that in mind, I want us to consider two pieces of armor today and then go together, which is why we're bringing them together. The belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. And I'll explain why they go together as we talk about it. First, we're told that we need to put on the belt of truth. Now, the question is, what is the belt of truth? Well, ultimately, the belt of truth is God's Word. It's God's Word. We need to surround ourselves with the Word of God. What we need to understand is that Jesus says in John 17, of the scriptures, he says, your word is truth. It's all truth. It is, in fact, the foundation for every other truth that we will come across. And it is the thing by which everything that claims to be truth has to come and be judged. So, to put on the belt of truth is to bring God's word into our lives and surround ourselves with it and make ourselves strong with that word because the belt 
is like the kernel that gets us ready for the battle. Okay? Think of it this way. If you're going into battle, we don't want your pants to fall down. <laughs> What's going to hold you up and hold everything together? The belt. You need the truth of God in you and on you. Now the question is, how do you put it on? Well, we're told over and over again in Scripture, how do you put it on? You meditate on the Word of God. Now I want to say something about meditation that I've said before, but not as often as maybe I should. When we meditate on the Word of God, and the reason we need to meditate on it day and night is because the Holy Spirit wants to transform us through that Word. And we need to understand the reason we need to take time in the Word, in the Bible, is because the Bible begins as information. But as we think about it and pray about it, the Holy Spirit will use that information until it becomes revelation. That time when we're finally reading that word and we're like, whoa, wait a minute. I get this. This is really speaking to me. How many times does that happen? You'll read it over and over and over again. You might have read that scripture 50 times. And then one day, you're meditating on it, reading it, and wham! It's like, wow, wait a minute. That word is for me. <coughs> And then you meditate on it more, and then what happens? Transformation. You begin to change. You begin to put off the old man, put on the new man. You die to sin, and you live to Christ. We need to get the word deep, 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 deep within us. So that the Holy Spirit can transform us to the point where we're thinking, not like the old rebel, but like Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important that we spend time in the Word. Not just memorizing it, although that's important. But thinking on it, praying about it, focusing on it, asking the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what that means. So that the truth of God can be in us and around us so that we're ready when the evil day comes, because we've been transformed on the inside. Now, the second piece of armor is that breastplate of righteousness. And the reason that it goes with the belt is because of this. You see, when Paul was writing this piece of scripture, and the Holy Spirit was working with him, in this writing. The image he was thinking about by the Holy Spirit was the armor of a Roman soldier. So all the pieces of armor are found on a Roman soldier. Well, the belt of truth, the belt, was very important for two reasons. First, it kept everything together, but the other thing was that that breastplate that went on the Roman soldier I was reading about this, and it clipped in to a slot in that belt. So that the breastplate was supported by the truth, the belt. Alright? So what you put on yourself here is supported by what you have here. This one keeps it on. Why is that important? Well, the breastplate is the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness. And it's important that we know the truth about our righteousness. And why is that? Well, one of the chief weapons of the enemy is guilt. And he will remind you continually of all the things that you have thought or said or done in your past that prove him to be guilty and not right to God. <laughs> How many times does that happen to any of us? Sometimes you're walking around, that happens to me, I'm walking around and something will come and it will remind me of something I did in the past 
And I'm like, oh man. Wow. That was really hurtful and stupid. I'm not doing that now. But the evidence reminded me of what I did. Why? Because he wants you to feel guilty. And if you're walking around trying to be right with God by your own righteousness, then let me tell you something. When the enemy comes at you with guilt, it will work. You know why? Because our righteousness does not measure up to God's standards. And there are a lot of Christians who feel guilty and unrighteous because they're trying to measure their rightness with God based on human standards. And they realize that that's not good enough. There are a lot of people trying to work themselves into heaven or work themselves into a place where God will care about that. And if we spend our time doing that, the devil will continue to make us feel guilty and we'll actually end up getting exhausted and depressed because we'll go, I, I, I can't do it. God can never love someone like me. And if we're looking at our own righteousness, that's what's going to happen. But I want you to see something. The Bible clearly tells us, remember the Bible is the truth, that's the belt we're wearing. The Bible clearly tells us that by works of the law, or by the works of our own, no one will be accounted right before God. What that means is that if we're going to be right with God, we need something better than our own righteousness. And guess what? We have it. We have it. In Isaiah 53, we are told that through the, 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 the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus by His sacrifice, He has perfectly fulfill the justice that the Father demands because of sinful humanity. And therefore, He is the one who by His sacrifice and resurrection accounts all who believe in Him to be right. So when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, guess what happens? The Father accounts you as being what? Righteous. You're right with him. Not because of something you did, but because of a gift that comes to you through faith in Jesus Christ. We see this, by the way, in Matthew 22. In Matthew 22, we find that in this parable, the Father says, Go and gather everyone you find, bring them to the wedding feast. The wedding feast is the return of our Lord, okay? The return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they gather everyone, bad and good. And what that means is that you're not so bad that God is calling you to salvation, and you're not so good that you don't need it. Call them both. And there's one requirement, just one, that they all have to follow. And you know what that is? They got to put on the wedding garment. What does that signify? Righteousness. So that when the Father uh, comes to examine the death, that's, that's talking about the final judgment. Everyone who's wearing that garment is an honor to us and a part of the family. Now I want to ask you a question. How did they get that wedding garment? They couldn't go home again. They couldn't make one themselves. No. At that time, if the host invited you to the wedding feast, he's the one that gave you the garden. You see that? The Father gives you the gift of righteousness when you receive the invitation to receive his son as Lord and Savior. So that when he sees you, 
He doesn't see your finances. He sees his son's finances on him. And why is that important for us to see? Because, dear friends, if you're wearing the righteousness of Jesus on you, who is perfectly perfect, who never sinned, who is completely obedient to the Father, when the devil comes and says to you, you think you're righteous? Remember what you did way back? You know what you can say to him? You can say to the devil, you know what, devil? You're quite right. Way back then, I did this or that. But that's not me anymore. I've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. And I am wearing the righteousness of Jesus Christ, who is perfectly perfect, who did not sin, completely obedient. And that's what the Father sees on me. So why don't you attack that righteousness and, and see how far that gets you? The devil's got nothing on Jesus. And if you're wearing his righteousness, he's got nothing on you. And that's the breastplate of righteousness. His righteousness. That protects your heart and the new man within you from the guilt that the devil keeps wanting to put on you. Now how do you put it on? Well, I imagine we put it on this way. When those people came to the wedding feast and the father gave them the garment, what do you think they said? When somebody gives you something, what do you say? Thank you. We just give him thanks. We give him friends. We give him glory. Because he has saved us and redeemed us and given us a right standing with him that cannot fail because it's not ours. It's his. And if we have his rights, then we can stand against the devil and tell him where to go. So if you want to put on the righteousness, whenever you start hearing that word, that you're guilty, that you're not worthy, that God can't love you. Remember whose righteousness you have. And put it on by giving praise and thanksgiving to the Father who loved us through His Son. Give glory to Jesus. And give in the Spirit to give Him praise. That's how you put it on. But always remember that that righteousness has to be attached to fulfill the truth. If you're trying to run around with righteousness other than the one that's actually given to you by the truth, the word of God, you're not coming. But if you put on his own, then you're coming. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Thank you that you have made us righteous through your Son, Jesus. Thank you for the shed blood that was shed on our behalf to forgive our sins. And thank you for the resurrection. Lord Jesus, you live, you rule, you reign, you're awesome. And you are our righteousness. Thank you. Lord, keep us mindful of where our righteousness really is. It's in you. And Lord, keep us grounded in your truth that we may overcome the works of the devil. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, we're going to sing our next hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer. Is that in the Red Hymnal? Sweet Hour of Prayer? All right, so let's find that in the Red Hymnal.
Sweet out of the
We pray your salvation for our president, the vice president, the Senate, the House, the Supreme Court, our governors, state legislators, state, local, and federal officials and judges. Lord, where they're right, sustain them. But where they're wrong, grant them the spirit of grace and supplication to recognize their wrongs, to mourn over their sins as for only son, to throw all their infamous decrees into the fire and burn them forever, and to establish policies that are pleasing in your sight and for the furtherance of your kingdom. Raise up righteous men and women who would rule not according to the flesh, but according to your spirit and your word. Lord, we also pray that you would forgive and cleanse our nation, bring a great awakening to our country. Cleanse us, Lord, from the shedding of innocent blood. Cleanse us, Lord, from idolatry, witchcraft, and the occult. Cleanse us, Lord, from the pride of life, from the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the flesh. Cleanse us, Lord, make us to see the truth by your Holy Spirit, and cause us to cry out to you, Lord Jesus, and be saved. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Lord Jesus, you have commanded us to pray for the people of Israel. Let now be the time when they recognize you, the one who made pierced, more than you is for a lonely son, and are cleansed by your blood, filled with your spirit, and joined in your church as the one you made. Raise up your church in Israel, that they will preach your word boldly with power, while you lift up your hand and heal with miracles, wonders, and signs of tending, and that the people of Israel would see the glory and the power of the risen Christ, and say, Blessed is he, Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, the Son of God, who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Lord Jesus, you are the healer. And by your stripes, we are the only thank you for that. Lord, we pray for a, a supernatural creative miracle in the Garrett family. Mm -hmm. That he should receive new kidneys yes. in Jesus' name. We also pray your healing on Inez Clyde, Bohemian Yoda, Roger Rollis, Doug Sari, Donald Donner, Rose Winkler, Linda Winkler, Tim Henderson, Keith Hansen, Cooper Parks, Brian Halpin, Jeremiah Swall, Judy Matheson, Jim Drescher, Sarah Duffer, Jack Devaney, Helen Beck, Doris Michaelis, and Kim McKinney. We also pray for your blessing on our military personnel. Rose Denise, David Burke, Sammy Hines, Riley Legacy, and Harvey Hagman. And we pray your blessing on all those we mentioned now in our outline or in our hearts. Yes. I pray for Caleb's. Yes. I pray for our brothers and sisters at Gilgit, Andrea Sandstreet, for uh, Jerica. Uh, and I pray for uh, Kate and Jacob and me. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Yes. And for Patrick's neighbor. Yes. Lord, we also want to lift up the family of our own God. Pray for Terry Harland and for uh, Royal Rattle, Lord Jesus. Thank you for healing in their lives. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.
Let us pray. Merciful Father, we offer you joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the night in which you must betray our Lord Jesus to the bread, and thanks to him, and give to his disciples, saying, Take eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after the supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it for all the bread, saying, This cup is the covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. And as we are his disciples on earth, let us praise our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And you know what? I, if it's all right, I want to try something a little different today. This is something that we're doing over in the, at Trinity Berlin. But this way, too, we can still be a little more personal in, in Holy Communion. Uh, that we stand up here and just speak the word. Oh, that's important. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, the packet and I'll give you individually the hopes. But then I'll set up this when we come to, to this side. This will be over here. So you take your wine, put it in, in, in the basket like you would, go back there to you. And then when it's time for this side, I'll move this over here. And then you take your wine and go back to you. You want us to pull the table a little bit further forward so you can be standing behind it? Or I'll, I'll move it. Okay. I'll move it. But yeah, from now on, we'll move it, move it forward a little bit. Yeah. All right. I will, I'll, I'll explain it as you come. Okay. All right? Go for it. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. we're going to do this. Okay. So. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to move the table right now over here. Okay. And I'll be right here. And I'll give you the, the wafer. And then you move over here. I'll say, what a price check for you. You drink it, throw it in the basket, head over to that here. Okay? <clears throat> Body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed. Body of Christ given for you, and the blood of Christ shed. Body of Christ given for you, and the blood of Christ shed. Body of Christ given for you. And the blood of Christ shed. Body of Christ given for you.
body of Christ given for you, and the blood of Christ shed for The body of the Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the woes of those whom you have fed one heavenly food. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and grant his feet. The Lord look upon you in favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, serve the crucified and risen Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, we're going to sing our, our last hymn. Um, and it's not going to be in the hour. But we'll, we'll, we'll sing, um, I have decided to follow Jesus. Number 26, in your, uh, in your folder. Number 26. No, we're too Yeah.